Okay, Joshua chapter number 22 for the message this morning. Joshua chapter number 22. We'll read one verse together and start heading towards the message. Joshua 22 and verse number 5. Joshua 22 verse 5. Once you find it, won't you stand? And we'll read this one verse of scripture aloud together. We'll pray. And then we'll get in the message this morning. Joshua chapter 22. And verse number 5. Let's read this together. The Bible says, But take diligent heed to do the commandment and the law which Moses, the servant of the Lord, charged you, to love the Lord your God, and to walk in all his ways, and to keep his commandments, and to cleave unto him, and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word this morning. It's truth, it's perfection, it's power. Lord, the copy that we have to read, the ability to read it, the Holy Spirit, to give us understanding. Thank you for those who are assembled in the church house today to hear it preached. Lord, would you help us? God, would you minister your truth from your word to our hearts this morning? Help us to hear, help us to receive, help us to understand, help us to glorify you by being hearers of the word and by being doers of the word. Uh, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ and amen. You can be seated. Joshua chapter 22, 5. We understand the commandments and the laws that are referred to in this verse were given by God to Moses on top of Mount Sinai for the nation of Israel to govern their life in the land God had promised to their fathers, Abraham and Isaac of Jacob. We're, we're familiar with some of these laws. The most famous would have to be the ten that are recorded in Exodus chapter 20, also in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 5. But God's law contains much more than just ten commandments. There are, in fact, 613 separate commands, separate laws in this set of regulations that God gave to the nation of Israel. It touched on all different aspects of the life that they were to live in the promised land of Canaan. Here's what we understand from Romans chapter number 2, that some of those laws, some of those commandments that God gave to Israel were also written on the heart of every man, woman, boy, and girl ever to live on the face of the earth. That, that God wrote His law in our conscience. We instinctively know the difference between right and wrong. We recognize wrong when somebody else does it to us. You lie to me, I'm going to judge you for that and say you shouldn't have done it. But in doing so, I'm condemning myself because I too have stretched the truth from time to time. <laughs> so laws contained in the Old Testament like thou shalt not covet, well that's just as binding on a Gentile as it is on a Jew. God wrote that on your conscience. The commandment thou shalt not kill, that was not only a sin for the nation of Israel, it's a sin for you this afternoon. Don't try it. All right? That thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Some of those laws given by God to Israel on Mount Sinai are also written on your heart and your conscience this morning. And it is a sin to transgress or to violate those laws. But again, we said there were more than ten. There's 613. And, and, and many of those, I would even say the majority or most of those laws and commandments that God gave Moses on Mount Sinai for the nation of Israel to govern their life in the promised land have absolutely nothing to do with my life or your life as a New Testament Christian. It's important that we understand that. Many of those laws have absolutely nothing to do with the relationship to God of an unsaved Gentile at any point in history or in the future. For example, if I eat pork 
or if I don't eat pork. That has nothing to do with my relationship to God. That was one of the laws God gave to the nation of Israel for their life in the promised land. There were dietary restrictions, praise the Lord, that are not imposed on New Testament Christians. That doesn't influence my relationship to God. Every creature of God is good. Can I get an amen? Okay? That was the most enthusiastic amen yet today. It's a little sad. So this morning, if, if my shirt is 50% cotton and 50% polyester, I'm not sinning. Now, the Jews were forbidden to wear any garments of mixed fabric. The warp couldn't be different from the woof. <laughs> I'm not sure what that means, but I, it's fun to say. All right. This afternoon, if I had a field and I wanted to go to that field and use different kind of seeds in that field, it would be okay. But for the Jews, that practice was forbidden. Now, so, so all kinds of commandments in that law that Joshua 22.5 is talking about that are exclusive to the Hebrew people. It's also important we understand this. God did not give them those commandments so that they could keep them and get to heaven. That was not the purpose. That was never stated to be the purpose. He gave them those commandments to make them different from all the other nations. And he promised them that if they kept those commandments, he would bless them and prosper them and protect them and keep them safe and keep them healthy and keep them fed. And all of that said for the purpose of the message this morning is, is what I want to do. I want us to understand what we're talking about, but then I want to take this verse and other verses from the book of Joshua that talk about keeping God's law and keeping God's commandments, and I want to make some spiritual applications to our lives as New Testament Christians. Because God did not give us those commandments but God did give us some commandments. And we're not saved by keeping the commandments God gave us any more than any of them could have been saved by keeping the commandments that God gave them, but they were promised there's some blessings to be obtained by walking according to my statutes, and though the blessings held out to us as New Testament Christians are different from the blessings held out to Old Testament Israelites, there are still blessings, saved brothers and sisters, that we may obtain by keeping the commandments that God has given us. In fact, the blessings we can have are greater, better than the blessings held out to Israel under the Old Testament. Now hold Joshua 22. We're going to come back there quickly. Go to Romans chapter 15 and 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm going to show you my biblical basis for making application from the passages we're going to read together this morning. Romans 15 and 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. Romans 15 and verse number 4. Romans 15 and verse 4. The Bible says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime. Now, what things would those be? The, th the things that were written before the New Testament, that would be the Old Testament. No trick questions this morning. It's okay. You can, you can actually respond out loud when I ask a question if you want to. The things that were written aforetime, that would be the Old Testament scriptures. Why were they written? Were written for our learning that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. Now, those scriptures were not written to us, we weren't alive yet. Those commandments weren't given to us. We're not Israelites, but they are written for us. There is something that God wants us to learn from them, so it's important that we read them and study them and understand them because all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. That means it'll help you. Probable for doctrine, correction, instruction, in righteousness. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 
1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant. He said, look, I, I need you to know this. I need you to understand this. In the passage that follows, he goes on to recount events from the Old Testament. He said, I need you to be uh, familiar with Old Testament history. Why? Verse number 11. Now all these things happen unto them for in samples. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Here's what the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 10. I want you to read the Old Testament. I want you to be familiar with the Old Testament. I want you to know the Old Testament because I need you to learn some lessons from the people and the places and the events and the concepts that are recorded from Genesis through Malachi, even though it's not necessarily to you or not necessarily about you, it is applicable. There are some examples. There are some warnings. There is some teaching. Here's a life lesson for all of us, but especially for the young people. It is way better. It is so much better to learn from other people's mistakes than to have to make those mistakes on your own and learn from the bitter consequences of bad decisions. In the Old Testament, we read about people who did really dumb things and suffered the consequences. And what we're supposed to do is say, hey, let's not do the same thing. Let's try something different. Amen. Disobeying God doesn't work out all that well. Right. Going my own direction is going to take me the wrong direction. Yes, okay, so we're supposed to learn the Old Testament and read the Old Testament and, 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 and understand some things that will help us in our lives today. So God didn't give us 613 commandments to govern our life in the city of Deland, in the county of Volusia, in the year 2021. Those commandments we read in the Old Testament, they're not binding on New Testament Christians other than the ones God wrote in your heart. But he did write all of those laws and commandments down. And he did give us the history of the people to whom he gave all of those laws and commandments, and he wants us to read about it and learn about it and he wants us to teach us something from all of it. And that's what I want to show you in the book of Joshua this morning. Back to the book of Joshua, chapter number 22. Before we get a little bit more into the verse, I want to give you the historical background to the book of Joshua and a brief overview of the typology of the picture that God is giving us here and how what these people experienced in the Old Testament relates to our experience as New Testament Christians. And, and once we get that, that'll get us ready for the message from this verse. So when you come to the book of Joshua, the nation of Israel is finally taking possession of the promised land. But, but what got them to this point, back up in your minds to the book of Exodus. The children of Israel are slaves down in Egypt for 400 years. God raises up Moses to deliver his people. The Lord sends ten plagues on Egypt. You read about that in the book of Exodus. It all culminates in the death of the firstborn on Passover night. And if you read Exodus 12, what God told the Hebrew people to do was to take the blood of an innocent lamb and apply that blood to the posts of the door. And, and when God came through on Passover night and he saw the blood of an innocent lamb apply to the door of the Israelite households, the Bible says that he would pass over that house. The firstborn would not die. And God would... So, so that's what they did. And it was on that night, on Passover night, the children of Israel left Egypt's bondage. It's, it's called the exodus because it was their exit or their departure from slavery in Egypt. They leave Egypt on Passover night 
and they're bound for the promised land. They're heading to Canaan, the land that God promised Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. It's described as a land that flowed with milk and honey. On the way, they cross the Red Sea. After they cross the Red Sea, they stop at this place called Mount Sinai, where God gave the nation the laws and rules and commandments that we've discussed. And what God did when he gave them those commandments, he said, here's what will happen if you keep my commandments. Here's what will happen if you don't keep my commandments. Never did he say you get to heaven by keeping my commandments, which is a good thing because nobody ever did. Until Jesus Christ came, God manifested in the flesh. He fulfilled the law so that he could die for our sins in our place. But he said, I'll bless you. I'll prosper you. I'll keep you healthy, I'll give you peace and safety. Once you get to that land, if you live by these laws, you're going to enjoy it, it's going to be great. Now, from Sinai to the promised land was supposed to be an 11 day journey. Quite a feat with 2 million people, supposed to be an 11 day journey. Journey. How long did that end up taking? For 40 years, the children of Israel wandered in that wilderness. Why? Well, they did not believe God's promise to take them into the promised land and drive out the inhabitants of the land and give them victory over the giants that inhabit the land. And Because they didn't believe, they didn't obey. And so they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Everybody that was an adult outside of Joshua and Caleb, everybody that was an adult when the Israelites left Egypt died without ever entering into Canaan. The Bible says their carcasses fell in the wilderness. When we come to the book of Joshua, Moses has died, and it falls to Joshua to lead the people into the possession of the promised land. So Joshua, this book records how they conquered their enemies, how they drove out the people that inhabited the land, and how God kept the promises he had made to bring them in and give them possession, again, of the land that God promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So that's, those are the events that take place, and here's what they picture. Here's the typology. Israel's deliverance from Egypt's bondage is a wonderful picture of the salvation of a sinner. Because Jesus said in John 8, 34, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. Colossians chapter 2 says we were in bondage under the elements of the world. But Christ, our Passover, 1 Corinthians 10 is sacrificed for us. And Jesus came and he was the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world and he shed his pure and innocent and spotless blood. And if we trust in him, that blood washes us from our sins and cleanses us from our iniquity and gives us new life in Jesus Christ. If, if the blood of Jesus Christ applied to your heart, then God's judgment will pass over you. Just like the children of Israel were delivered from Egypt's bondage by the blood of the Lamb, so the sinner can be delivered from the wages and consequence of sin, but only, only through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's completely by grace. By grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, once God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt and across the Red Sea, what was their next stop? It was Sinai, where God gave them some rules to live by. Right? So, so God saves the sinner... I'm translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son. I'm I'm taken from darkness to light, from death to life. I'm secure in Jesus Christ. I'm saved by grace. But you know what God did once He saved me? He gave me some rules to live by. 
He gave me some commandments to keep. Why? To get to heaven? Not a chance. It couldn't happen. Why? So I can keep them to a certain level so as to keep my salvation? If that's the case, we're all doomed. God didn't give us these commandments so we could get saved. He didn't give us these commandments so we could keep them to stay saved. He gave us these commandments because they are the means whereby He can shed blessing on our lives right now until the time that we get to heaven. All right? So getting out of Egypt for the nation of Israel, it wasn't because they kept God's law. He hadn't even given it to them yet. God redeemed them by His mercy and His grace through the blood of the Lamb. But, entering into Canaan, taking possession of Canaan, living and enjoying the land that flows with milk and honey, that was completely dependent on their obedience to the laws and the rules and commandments that God gave them. So, with the saved child of God, deliverance from sin, a promised home in heaven, salvation, everlasting life, that is completely dependent on God's mercy and God's grace and the blood of Jesus Christ. But having saved us and brought us out of Egypt, He then gives us some rules, some commandments to to live by so that we can enjoy the promised land. So, so what in, in the typology, in the picture, in the lesson that we're to learn from this narrative in the Old Testament, what is the promised land supposed to represent? Now be careful. If you get your theology from Southern Gospel music, you're going to get real confused. <laughs> right? Because I don't have to cross Jordan alone. I'm Bound for the promised land. Wonderful songs, but if you sing those songs and think they're what the Bible says, you'll equate the promised land with heaven. And here's the problem with that. You have to keep commandments to stay in the promised land. (laughs) When they got to the promised land, there were enemies there that they had to drive out. When they got the promised land, they had to keep God's commandments or God would remove them from the promised land. Have you read the rest of the Old Testament? That's exactly what happened. They they rebelled against God's law. They went after idols. They went into captivity. They were scattered across the earth. I'm glad the promised land doesn't equal heaven. That means we get kicked out. (laughs) If the promised land was heaven, we get to heaven, there'd be the devil. No, Canaan is not a representation or a picture of heaven. Canaan, brother, sister, it's the victorious Christian life. It's what Jesus said in John 10.10. Look, he doesn't just give us eternal life, that's in heaven. He gives us life more abundant, and that's right here on the earth. God filling your heart with love and joy and peace and satisfaction and contentment. That's the promised land. I'm not talking Joel Osteen, you're going to find a million dollars in your bank account tomorrow. I'm saying something that's real, something that lasts. It's not physical. It's not material. It's better than that. It's spiritual. It's inside. And, and, and God said, look, I want to bring you into this land and let you enjoy this land. It flows with milk and honey, but, but, this is conditioned on your obedience to my commandments. Look, you get saved by grace through faith and never keep any of God's commandments and still get to heaven. You can't enjoy the Christian life that way. Okay? So what happened to many of those Israelites? They were delivered from Egypt. They got out of bondage. They're not Pharaoh's slaves anymore. But for 40 years, they wandered the wilderness till every last one of them dropped dead. That was the majority 
You know, you know what the majority of Christians do? They receive God's gift of salvation. The free gift of God which is eternal life through Jesus Christ. But they never enter the promised land. Now they're going to die and they're going to go to heaven. Praise the Lord. But that's not that all God has for you. That's not the purpose for which he saved you. It's a land that flows of milk and honey and, and it's good and it's... A, and God wants you to have that. He gave you some commandments to regulate and direct and control your life, to lead you into the enjoyment of those blessings. Are we all clear on the picture? Do we see the typology? that This divides this crowd, any crowd, into three groups of people. There are those who have never been delivered from Egypt's bondage. They're unsaved, still in their sin, the wrath of God abideth on them, John 3.36. That could be you here this morning. And for you this morning, the message stops right here. Trust Jesus Christ. Believe the gospel. Get saved. Stop trying to get to heaven by being a good person. The God who's going to judge you wrote a book that says there's none good. No, not one. But that God is good, and He loves you, and He sent His Son. His Son died on the cross for your sins, was buried and rose again three days later, and said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. You're still in Egypt. You need to get out. The only way out is the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Now, that's the majority of the world, that first group. There's a second group. They're out of Egypt, but they're not in the promised land. And that's where far too many saved people stay. Because I'm glad I, I, I've got Jesus as my Savior. I'm just not interested in Him as my Lord. I want Him to take my sin away. I want Him to give me a mansion house. But He can leave me alone till I get there. And they just wander around and they die in the wilderness without ever experiencing the... Bl- can you imagine getting out of Egypt? Can you imagine being Moses and, and, and all you get is a peak from the top of Mount Pisgah? You saw God work all those miracles, send all those plagues, feed you with manna for 40 years, but you didn't believe Him enough to enjoy the blessings He had prepared for you. Now, now that's where most saved people are. They're out of Egypt, but they're not in Canaan. What does it take to possess? What does it take to enjoy the promised land? Obedience. Yes, sir. Pay attention to what God said. Do what God said. Keep His laws, His commandments, the ones He gave you. <laughs> Read about those in the New Testament. Now, all, the, all that builds in the message, because what I want to show you from the book of Joshua, quickly three things, three characteristics that are required in order for us to have a life of obedience that will lead us into the promised land. So so I get saved by trusting Jesus Christ. I enjoy the blessings of the Christian life when when I get in the Bible, find out what it says, and try to live by it. But here's what that's going to take. Three characteristics that I can develop in my life that are going to tend toward obedience... So I can enjoy the fullness of what God intends for my life as a saved child of God. Joshua chapter 22 and verse number 5, the Bible says, But take diligent heed to do the commandment and the law. The first thing it takes to obey is diligence. And that's why so many don't. Did you see what it said in the verse? But take diligent heed. Heed to do the commandment and the law. Diligence is steady application in a business of any kind. Diligence is constant effort to accomplish what is undertaken. Diligence is exertion of body or mind without unnecessary delay or sloth. Diligence is due attention or industry. Look, it does not take any effort to get saved. It takes faith to get saved, but it takes diligence to obey God's 
word. We're not going to take the time to go to the passage, but in 2 Peter chapter, chapter 1, the Bible says that God has given us who are saved all things that pertain to life and godliness. God has fully equipped us with the Holy Spirit inside, with the Bible, with the church, with Christian fellowship. We are fully equipped to live the Christian life. He has given us exceeding great and precious promises whereby we may be partakers of the divine nature. But then verse 5 says, beside all this, giving all diligence add to your faith. If you want to move past being saved and actually be a Christian, that means a follower of Jesus Christ, a disciple of Jesus Christ, being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, that's going to take some diligence, some effort, some steady application. You're going to get out of it what you put into it. You know why many Christians wander around and die in the wilderness? One word, laziness. Laziness. The Bible says in Timothy 2.15, Study show thyself proven of God a, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. If I want God to approve of my life, I'm going to have to work at it. Y'all a lot more excited about being able to eat pork. That's what the Bible says. Obedience is required to enjoy Canaan. Diligence is required to obey. Now, why do we need diligence? Let me me give you the definition again. The definition of diligence is steady application in the business of any kind. Diligence is constant effort to accomplish what is undertaken. Here's why obedience requires diligence, because obedience is not a once and done proposition. Salvation's that way. Once and done, you're born again. You can only be physically born once. You can only be spiritually born once. That's settled. That momentary transaction takes place. We trust Jesus Christ. But obedience, what it's going to take to enjoy the promised land, That's going to be today and tomorrow and the next day and next week and next month and throughout every day of the year. It is a daily, ongoing, continual commitment. Here's what I'm saying. You're not going to get in the promised land on an every once in a while Bible reading program. You're going to have to be diligent about it. You are not going to be a victorious Christian... On an, I'm going to go and I feel like it kind of church attendance. It, that, that's just not the way it works. You're going to have to be steady. You have to be consistent. You're going to have to be faithful. Look, you can, you, you can go to church once a week and be saved and go to heaven. You're going to have to go more times than that if you want to enter into Canaan and enjoy the promised land. How healthy would you be if you ate once a week? Some of us maybe more so. It's beside the point. For a little while. You can't maintain that. You see what we're saying? You've got to eat every day. You got to take in water every day. There are things you have to do constantly to maintain your physical health, and your spiritual life is no different. It requires diligence. You got to get in this book every day. You need to be in church every time the doors are open, exhorting one another while it's called a day, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Hebrews 10 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, so much the more. As you see the day approaching. Here's what I'm saying. You can't wait until the alarm goes off on Sunday morning to decide whether or not you're going to church that day. Okay? We have an evening service at 6 o'clock. You you take a Sunday afternoon nap. You can't wait until the alarm goes off at the end of your Sunday afternoon nap to figure out, "Mm, do I want to go tonight? 
Now look, look. I'm, I'm just saying, if you want to go into Canaan, you've got to obey. If you want to obey the Lord. You know, there's a lot in that Bible about how God wants you to live. It takes some work to learn it all. You can't just take a one semester course and, and, and be done with it. You get in this book, you'll study it for a lifetime. But what's the purpose of that study? To show thyself approved unto God. To find out what God wants me to be, how God wants me to live, what God wants me to do, so I can do it. How much effort are you willing to put into that? Well, that's going to be how much you get out of it. Here, here, I'm going to challenge you this morning, 2021, why don't you make it a goal, I've already said it, be in your Bible every single day. Maybe you've never read all of God's words before. This should be the year that you get that done. Maybe you've read it a hundred times before. There's still so much to learn. Diligence, diligence, steady, consistent, faithful. Come to Joshua 23. What's it going to take to enter Canaan? Obedience. What's it going to take to obey? Diligence. Second thing, Joshua 23, verse number 6. Joshua 23, verse number 6. Be ye therefore very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, that ye turn not aside therefrom to the right hand or to the left. You know, the second thing it's going to take to obey Courage. Yes, Courage. God told the nation of Israel, you need to be courageous to keep all these commandments. Now let's talk about courage for just a moment. Courage is not the absence of fear. In fact, courage presupposes fear. If there's no fear involved, there's no courage required. <laughs> right? So courage is not, I'm not afraid. Courage is, I'm afraid, but I'm going to do it anyway. Yeah, right? Yeah. So why does it take courage to obey the Lord? Why does it take courage to keep God's commandments? Well, you're going to quickly find out a lot of things God tells you to do aren't necessarily easy. Sure. <laughs> Most of the things that God commands us Go contrary to the flesh. You'll quickly find that being obedient to the Lord is not going to make you the most popular person on your job, in your school, in your family, in your neighborhood. You're not going to win any popularity contests by trying to keep God's word. Obeying the Lord is going to set you in opposition to most of the rest of the world. That's just the way it is. This world is dead set against God. And when you're for God, that makes people uncomfortable. And so it's going to take some courage. If you don't have any backbone, you're not getting into Canaan. If you're not willing to plant your feet, take a stand... You can say farewell to the land that flows with milk and honey. You know what God wants you to do? He wants you to witness. He wants you to tell people about Jesus Christ. He wants you to declare the gospel. You know that takes courage? To approach a stranger and engage in conversation about their soul, that's very private. That's, that, that's somewhat uncomfortable, but did God tell you to do that? Did He say go in all the world and preach the gospel to every creature? Did he say, ye shall be witnesses unto me? I mean, some people, some people don't mind. Most people, a little bit too timid for that. Do you know what you need? you got to obey. It's going to take some courage. I remember the first time you got on a street corner with a scripture sign. And you're going to hold that scripture sign in a public place. Now that, now that you've been doing it for 10 years, you don't even understand why you were scared. But the first time you ever did it, you're hiding behind the sign so nobody could see you. It took some courage. But God blessed it, didn't he? 
And God helped you, didn't He? And so if you had enough courage to take a stand for the Lord, then you could obey. Do what He wanted you to do. How about, how about passing out gospel tracts? Man, that'd be a great thing to do. We've got them in the back. We've got a, a, a rack in the hallway. Take as many as you want. Pass them out to as many people as you want. Here's a three and a half by five card with Bible verses to tell you how you can get your sins forgiven and have eternal life. It'd be okay to hand that to the cashier when you pay for your groceries. Amen. It'd be all right to take a little business card size track, slip that in the credit card reader when you pay for your gas. Somebody come behind you and find it. it It'd be all right to have those on you wherever you go and offer them to people. We do that together sometimes, but you can do it by yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Good. It takes courage, doesn't it? Yes, sir. You're doing it for 20 years and, and, and still you're, right. you're reaching in your pocket to bring out that track. And man, there's something inside that just says, oh, don't do it. Yes, sir. And there's something inside that says, no, you got to do it. <laughs> you know what you need? You need a little bit of courage. Just doing right in spite of the fear. Doing right in spite of the uncertainty. I'd say this. It'll take courage to give when you don't know which way this economy is going. But God said give. So we walk by faith. We obey the Lord. It takes courage to obey the Lord. Come to Joshua chapter 1. One more note on courage. Joshua chapter 1. Verse number six. We have a threefold basis for our courage in this passage. Joshua 1, verse 6 Be strong and of a good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. He said, Look, I want you to have courage, but I, I'm going to back it up with my promise. I promise this land to you, so take courage in my promise. Verse number 7, Only be thou strong and very courageous, thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart of thy mouth, thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then shalt thou make thy way prosperous, and then shalt thou have good success. In verse, verse 6 we have God's promise, in verses 7 and 8 we have God's provision. Then in verse 9, Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Verse 6 was the promise, verse 7 and 8 was the provision, verse 9 is the presence of God. Now here's what I want to say. It's a lot easier to have courage when you're 100% sure that you're right. That your cause is right, that your position is right, that your belief is right. You'd be a lot more courageous in something that you're sure of. Yes, sir. Right? This verse says we can take courage because God is with us. Amen. Now think about that. If God's with me, that means I'm right. Amen. If I make sure that I'm on God's side, then that's the right side. I can be courageous in claiming as true whatever God said was true. I can be courageous in my stand for what's right if it's what God said is right. You know why Christians lack courage? Because they spend way too much time with the television and Hollywood and Facebook and sports and they couldn't tell you what's in the Bible to save their life. Point one is going to lead to point two. If you're diligent in your reading and your study and your attending to the preaching of God's Word, you can be a lot more courageous in knowing that what you're doing is right. So what does it take to get into Canaan? Obedience. What does it take to obey? It takes diligence. It takes courage. Number three, Joshua 24. Joshua chapter 24. Last point this morning. Joshua 24. Verse 15. We'll read several verses here. 
This is Joshua's farewell address to the nation of Israel. In verse 15, he presents this challenge. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites whose land you dwell, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He put it on a plaque. He hung it on his wall. It was a direct decoration right there in his house. Verse 16, And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. Is, is this not a wonderful response? Joshua challenges them, said, you need to make a choice. Who are you going to serve? I'm going to serve the Lord. Verse 16, the whole congregation says, Joshua, we're with you. We want to serve God too. How could we do anything else? Verse 17, for Lord our God, they're going to back up their decision. He it is that brought us up and our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, which did those great signs in our sight, preserved us in all the way wherein we went, among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drave out from before us all the people, even the Amorites, which dwelt in the land. Therefore, look, with all that God's done for us, we are definitely going to come over on your side and we're going to serve the Lord. Therefore, will we also serve the Lord, for he is our God. Verse 19, and Joshua said to the people, ye cannot serve the Lord. Can you imagine that, that, that scene this morning? I mean, Joshua, he just preached this great message and he gave the invitation and everybody left their seats and flooded the altar. He said, get up and go back. You can't serve God. Is that what happened in Genesis, Joshua 24? It didn't happen in Genesis 24. Is that what happened in Joshua 24? Choose you this day. We're going to serve the Lord. You can't serve the Lord. Why would Moses, uh, Joshua, why would Joshua say that? Ye cannot serve the Lord, for he's an holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If ye forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then he will turn and do you hurt and consume you after thee hath done you good. Verse 21, the people said in Joshua, Nabal will serve the Lord. He's just as, they were just as confused as I was when I read the passage. <laughs> Joshua, what you talking about? We're, we're, we're going to serve God, we promise. Verse 22, Joshua said to the people, Your witness is against yourselves that you have chosen you, the Lord, to serve him. And they said, <laughs> they confirmed the third time, we are witnesses. Look at verse 23. Now therefore, put away said he, the strange gods which are among you. Put away the strange gods which are... These people who were so dead bent on their decision that they were going to follow Joshua and serve the Lord had idols in their tents. How could, how could we do anything other than serve the Lord? How could we do anything other than forsake strange gods like the ones that I have at home? I read this passage this morning. In Joshua 22, they were ready to annihilate two and a half tribes out of the twelve because they built an altar at the Jordan River and called it Ed. It was just this memorial, this altar, but they thought they're, they're going to offer something on the altar. We're going to kill them. Those same people had strange gods in their tent. God said, you can't serve me with those. Here's, here's what it takes to obey the Lord. It takes devotion. Because God's jealous. He's not interested in your divided loyalty. Yes, sir. He's not interested in divided affections. He said in Matthew 6, 24, no man can serve two masters. You're going to end up hating the one and loving the other, or serving the one, despising the other. That whole love and hatred thing in the Bible, it's a comparison. Right. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. God preferred Jacob. Jesus said, you, you can't be my disciple. You can't follow me if you don't hate 
Your father, mother, sister, brother. Now, that kind of contradicts the whole love your neighbor as yourself thing. What's he talking about? He's talking about preference. If mom comes before Jesus, you're not going into Canaan. If dad comes before your service to God, forget about the promised land. You be saved, go to heaven, but Jesus has got to take first place. You've got to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Everything else in your life is going to have to revolve around Jesus Christ and your service to Him. It takes that kind of devotion to have the obedience to carry you into the promised land. You know, there, there, there are a lot of competing interests in our lives, aren't there? Yes, sir. There are a lot of distractions, aren't there? A lot of the things that might not even be wrong, but they're just there to knock us off course, get us all entangled in the affairs of this life. Right. If, if, if we're going to have the obedience that it takes to enter Canaan, we're going to have to be 100% in on this. We're going to have to get rid of the strange gods. We're going to have to detach ourselves from some things, from whatever would hinder us from going out and serving the Lord. Look at, look at the crux of the matter in verse 23. And incline your heart unto the Lord, God of Israel. Another way to say devotion is love. Love. This is the love of God, 1 John 5, 3, that would keep His commandments. All right, so we can be saved by grace through faith. We can enjoy Canaan by obedience. What's it going to take for us to be obedient? We're going to have to be diligent about it. We're going to have to have some courage. We're going to have to fall in love yes, sir. with Jesus Christ. God, help us go that direction the coming year. Father, thank you for your word this morning, the truth that it teaches us. God, the patience of those who came to hear it preached uh, this morning. Thank you for the good attention to your word. I pray, I pray, God, that you would work these truths in our hearts. And God, this church would be full of saved people who want to obey you, please you, live for you, love you, serve you, and, uh, and be a blessing to those around them. Thank you, dear God, for the, the, the blessings promised and given. Uh, Lord, to those who order their lives according to your word, help us to do it, we pray in Jesus' name, and amen.